It is uh, a sort of uh, proud privilege for me today to welcome one of the most prominent historians of our time, uh, Professor Aisha Jalal, who has done a wonderful work in her field. She is considered as an authority on South Asian history. So it would be a very educating moment for us to listen to her. And with these words, I thank her and invite her to come to Rostrum and to speak to us. It's a great privilege and honor uh, for me to have been invited to speak uh, at the Sindh Madrasatul Islam. I will try uh, to give you um, a, a shorter version of what I do have. Uh, so let me begin. In one of the more memorable contemporary recollections of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Beverly Nichols, uh, a journalist from the UK, described the lanky and stylishly dressed barrister as the most important man in Asia. Looking every bit like a gentleman of Spain, of the old diplomatic school, the monocle-wearing leader of the All India Muslim League held a pivotal place in the future of India. If Gandhi goes, there is always Nehru or Raja Gopalachari or Patel or a dozen others. But if Jinnah goes, who is there? Without Jinnah to steer the course, the Muslim League was a potentially explosive force, thought Nichols, that might com run completely off the rails and charge through India with fire and slaughter. It might even start another war. As long as Jinnah was around, nothing disastrous was likely to happen. And so, Nichols quipped, a great deal hangs on the, the gray silk cord of that monocle. If Jinnah was the most important man in Asia on the eve of the British withdrawal from India, he was certainly not the only one flexing his muscle. His early death in September uh, 1948, uh, as you all know, robbed Pakistan of a much needed steady, steady hand uh, at the helm during an uncertain and perilous time. With Jinnah no longer around uh, to read uh, the occasional riot act, uh, constitutional propriety and strict adherence to the rule of law uh, were early casualties of the withering struggle between the newly created center, Pakistan center, and the provinces that became part of Pakistan. Instead of being settled and made part of an honored constitutional document, there is even today bitter disagreement on the principles and practices in Pakistan nearly 70 years after its establishment. I mean, we're hitting 70 uh, very soon. Uh, so while there's no denying the centrality of Muhammad Ali Jinnah's iconographic um, uh, location in Pakistani national consciousness, the gaping chasm between the nationalist icon and the savvy political practitioner cannot escape historical scrutiny. Across the 1947 divide, uh, clashing representations of Jinnah and his political um, uh, and his politics highlight uh, the fissures in the Indian um, national imaginary. The unanimous rage that exploded um, as Indian nationalism, whether of the secular or even the communal variety, against Jaswan Singh's book is indicative of Jinnah's negative standing in the Indian psyche. Left to an adoring following in Pakistan, and equally impassioned detractors in India, the clear-headed lawyer who never missed a cue has been reduced to a jumble of contradictions that mostly uh, cancel each other out. Jinnah's demonization in the Indian nationalist pantheon uh, as the communal monster who divided Mother India contrasts with his positive representation in Pakistan as a revered son of Islam, even an esteemed religious leader, a Molana who strove to safeguard Muslim interests in India. Misleading representations of one of modern South Asia's leading politicians might not have withstood the test of time if they did not serve the nationalist self-projections of both India and Pakistan. Nations need heroes, and Pakistanis have a right to be proud of their greatest hero. But popular memories, too, need to be informed by some bare facts and ideas. 
fed on improbable myths and limitations of the great men's approach to history, Pakistanis have been constrained uh, from engaging in an informed um, and open debate on whether their country at all merits being called Jinnah's Pakistan after 70 years. If Jinnah, is Jinnah at all relevant, really, uh, to uh, the current predicament of Pakistan? That's the question that I've come here to talk to you about. Even the most approximate answer requires training our sights on matters that most concern Pakistanis, rule of law and a balance between state institutions that is conducive to social justice, economic opportunities, and peaceful coexistence. Fed on state-sponsored nationalist yarns about the past, Pakistanis are at a loss on how to settle matters of national identity and the nature of the state. Should we have a democratic state or an authoritarian state? Uh, the debate continues. A secular state or an Islamic state? The dismay, confusion, and disenchantment enveloping the hapless citizenry are reason enough to return uh, to the drawing boards of history to assess Jinnah's contemporary relevance. Or so it seemed to me when I was asked to speak on Jinnah. Other men are lenses through which we read our own minds. One of my favorite American authors, Ralph Waldo uh, Emerson, once said, but the great man is one who inhabits a higher sphere of thought and keeps a vigilant eye on many sources of error. Though skeptical of approaches to history, restricted to studies of great men, um, it is difficult to disagree with Emerson, who was an ardent expositor of biography, that we can learn from those who are truly great uh, than those making a mockery of being great in our times. Over 30 years of research and writing on Muhammad Ali Jinnah leaves me in no doubt that the tension between the creator's vision and where Pakistan stands today can help us a great deal in restoring perspective on some of the key challenges confronting us today. In the short time available, I can only highlight Jinnah's continuing contemporary relevance uh, with reference to his commitment to constitutionalism and the rule of law, and with special reference, if I may, to his conception of federalism. The question has special salience for Pakistan, uh, as the constituent units of the Federation have been preparing to take full advantage of the provincial autonomy uh, provisions of the 18th Amendment. There can be no dispassionate understanding of Jinnah's place in history, far less his role as a Federalist par excellence, without salvaging his political career from the cobwebs of prejudice and partisan comment about his role in India's partition. As a politician who had set his sights on wresting power from the British at the center, at the All India Center, Dinah had to contend with contradictory pulls and pushes of Muslim provincial politics. By becoming the Muslim spokesman, uh, he tried negotiating a constitutional arrangement based on a sharing of power between the Congress and the Muslim League, representing Hindus and Muslims respectively. Even great men, make history under certain constraints. Many find it remarkable that Mr. Jinnah made history despite overwhelming odds. If there has been a bit too much focus on the history Jinnah made, there is still much to be said about the history that made Jinnah. There is no more glaring contradiction between the founder's vision and Pakistan today then the history, the long history, if I may say so, of constitutional stalemates between the judiciary and parliament, the civil military tussle, and the fragmentation and loss of institutional ethos among the administrative services that have been innovating the energies of a faltering, uh, elected, of a faltering elected governments uh, and distracting from uh, the state's primary role as a provider of security of life and property to say nothing of economic opportunity and well-being. The logical conclusion is not, as some are wont to assert, that Pakistan is incapable of evolving a viable democratic system and destined to remain as a centralized authoritarian state under military rule. Pakistan's struggle for democracy 
has suffered from sustained political dysfunction caused by the staggering nonchalance shown by successive governments for the aspirations of the federating units. Despite progress in devolving power to the constituent units under the 18th Amendment, it is by no means obvious that Pakistan has strengthened or is it even in the process of strengthening its federalism. Strong federations are not just made by a decentralization of power to the lower levels of administration, but in striking the right balance between the different tiers of state authority and giving the constituent units a stake at the federal center. Simply devolving power may, be, may in certain circumstances be detrimental to good governance if the infrastructure is absent and heighten, not lessen, provincial grievances. Allowing interested parties to stir trouble by encouraging secessionist and quasi-secessionist trends. In other words, power sharing at the center cannot be reduced to decentralization alone. Indeed, in certain circumstances, of which the partition of India in 1947 is a primary example, decentralization unmatched by effective power sharing arrangements at the center may well jeopardize the future of the Federation. This raises the key question. What did federalism mean to Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the die-hard constitutionalist? And how relevant is his perspective to Pakistan today? Those prone to rushing to conclusions without accounting for the historical context may slam Jinnah's insensitivity towards provincial aspirations for cultural and political autonomy at the time of Pakistan's creation, as people have never ceased doing. After all, the Qaeda wanted Muslims to get rid of the disease of provincialism and thought it a great curse that India's Muslims considered themselves to be Sindhi, Punjabi, Pathan, or Delhi Muslims first. If to err is human, then to be great is to be misunderstood. Everyone makes errors of judgment, though some do with intentions less noble than the desire to lend some semblance of unity to an incipient state born amidst pools of blood in a hostile and forbidding uh, uh, neighborhood. What I'm trying to get here is, is that you have to understand the context in which Jinnah started. The uncertainties of the immediate post-independence era, marred by horrific bloodletting and the forcible movement of several million people, confounded uh, the task of matching deeds and principles. Jinnah's death within um, a little over a year of independence uh, makes it difficult to surmise whether he would have compromised his commitment to constitutionalism and departed from principles he enunciated in articulating the case for a Pakistan. Even after allowing uh, for his centralist predilections, Jinnah's sense of constitutional propriety would have prevented him from either approving or going along with uh, the unconstitutional machinations in the immediate aftermath of independence that effectively sank Pakistan's chances to establish a viable federal and democratic polity. Eager to score points against his opponents, uh, the suave barrister uh, with um, his eye-catching monocle. I'm just giving you some photographs here. Um, adapted to new political realities without losing sight of the goals that animated his public career since its inceptions. An anglicized and moderate politician of the liberal ilk, Jinnah, if he were in our midst today, would recoil at his battered image. Um, in secular and democratic India. He would find no comfort also in his portrayal in Pakistan as a fervent Muslim. I know of no religion apart from human activity, the qaid -e azam had written to Mahatma Gandhi in January 1940, as it provides a moral basis for all other activities. Jinnah's broad humanistic outlook and vision for the subcontinent has sadly been distorted in the country that he created. And that has much to do with the political gamesmanship that has been played out here by authoritarian regimes uh, and self-styled ideologues of Islam. The ground rules for the future relationship between the government and the citizenry were laid down by the qaid -e azam as we all know, in his inaugural speech to the Pakistan Constituent Assembly. 
The first duty of governments of a government is to maintain law and order so that the life, property, and religious beliefs of its subjects are fully protected by the state. A second pressing issue, and the biggest curse from which India is suffering, Jinnah continued, was the poison of bribery and corruption. We must put that down with an iron hand, he exclaimed, and hope that adequate measures would be taken by the Constituent Assembly to deal with the problem of corruption. Above all else, the, the Qaeda asserted, if we want to make the state truly great, the state of Pakistan happy and prosperous, we should wholly and solely concentrate on the well-being of the people, and especially of the masses and the poor. Instead of the supremacy of the rule of law that Jinnah advocated and practiced, I'm sad to say that anarchy or almost a veritable anarchy functions uh, prevails in large swathes of Pakistan. Rampant corruption uh, has done irreparable damage to the moral fiber of the society, making a mockery of the relationship between the representatives and the represented. With the Muslim majority itself divided along class, regional, sectarian and ideological lines, minorities are facing persecution from peddlers of religion or local land mafias exploiting the loopholes in the legal system of a country founded paradoxically enough by one of the subcontinent's greatest constitutional lawyers and champions of minority rights. Whether you are Muslim, Hindu, Parsi or Christians, he told journalists at Allahabad in April 1942, all I can say to you is that however much I am criticized, however much I am attacked, and today I'm charged with hate in some quarters, I honestly believe that the day will come when not only Muslims, but this great community of Hindus will also bless, if not during my lifetime, after I am dead, the memory of my name. Jinnah drew an analogy between himself and the first man to appear on the street with an umbrella only to be laughed and scorned at by the crowd because they had never seen one before. You may laugh at me, he said, but a time will soon come when you will not only understand what the umbrella is, but use it to the advantage of every one of you. As a state for whose creation he is credited stands dangerously poised at the crossroads of chaos and order amid new and emergent shifts in domestic, regional, and international politics, Pakistanis, and also their hostile neighbors, Indians, urgently need to grasp the meaning of the qaeda azams metaphor. The Qaeda's prediction that posterity would come to look kindly on the umbrella he had unfurled, sorry, in the form of Pakistan, remains only partially realized. While the more circumspect uh, have been reassessing his legacy over the past few decades, uh, the very mention of his name, as I've already suggested, can fuel acrimonious debate across the Great Divide of 1947, confusing the end result with what, with what Mr. Jinnah had been after all along. His admirers and detractors alike hold him responsible for dismembering the unity of India. While shifting tactics in response to changing circumstances, Jinnah's strategic goals remained remarkably consistent throughout his long political career. The votaries of a unitary and monolithic sovereignty, borrowed ironically and paradoxically enough from the colonial masters, may have politically checkmated the Qaeda Azam, but his constitutional insights into the imperatives of forging a new Indian Union, once the British relinquished power at the center, resonated much better with a longer South Asian political tradition, historically, of layered and shared sovereignties. An overemphasis on religion as a panacea for all, explanations for everything, you don't need to go beyond that, it's an easy explanation, in the making of Pakistan, has obscured the role of Britain's changing imperial objectives and the clashing political dynamics at the All India and provincial levels that Jinnah had to contend with in order to achieve his aims of power sharing. It takes nothing away from the passions and sacrifices of ordinary people in 1947 and after to argue that Pakistan owes its existence primarily to Jinnah's astute understanding of the federal principle. 
Despite his centralist ambitions, he advocated provincial rights within an Indian federation before formally demanding Pakistan. Jinnah's defense of minority rights at the first roundtable conference in London during December 1930 led the British media to liken him to the American president, Woodrow Wilson. At the plenary session, Jinnah argued that if power was to be transferred to the center, the interests of all minorities had to be safeguarded. The entry of the princely states, the Indian princely states, and for those who don't know it, let me refresh it, 40% of India consisted of princely India, uh, which was 565 princely states, big and small, and the rest consisted of British India, 11 provinces that were British India. So his point is um, that he argued that the entry of the Indian princely states into the whole idea of an Indian federation uh, fundamentally, radically, he pointed out, altered the situation. It wasn't just about the British Indian provinces, but now also about 40% of princely India. And I do think that people don't understand how important the princely Indian issue really was. Proving that a nationalist is a nationalist, whatever uh, the party affiliation, um, the, Jinnah objected to the princely states joining the All India Federation on a different basis than uh, the British Indian provinces. And I'm going to really now talk to you because this is going to get confusing for those who don't understand. Now, what I'm trying to say is that Jinnah had always wanted the British to concede power at the All India level. The British instead used the princely states to prevent that from happening. And when the idea of a federation was finally accepted, and don't forget, for those who know their history, uh, that uh, the Nehru report wanted a unitary center. Uh, so the Muslim majority provinces wanted a federal, federal center. So Jinnah's point was that you, if you bring in the, prov the princely states, then uh, the princely states will delay matters because the princely states was asked by the British to determine what they would give up to the center. So he said this would take endlessly long, and the British are doing this to just delay um, uh, uh, sharing power, giving us power at the center, because the British point was that only when one half the princely states on the basis of population came into the Indian Federation would federation become uh, 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 operational, which meant that power had to be, uh, at the center would be delayed. You could have provincial autonomy under the Government of India Act of 1935, but power at the center would have to await the princes coming in. So effectively, Mr. Jinnah built his case for Pakistan on the point that if princely India could determine what powers they were going to give up to the center, well, so too the provinces. You cannot deny that to the provinces either, because the presumption was that Princely India would, could negotiate its way to the center, determining what they'd give up and what they wouldn't, whereas the British Indian provinces had no such choice. And so Jinnah's case for Pakistan was based on the right of the provinces to determine on what basis they would join the All India Center. So that's something that you have to understand. I'm not going to go into the details of his um, tactics, um, uh, but he did talk about uh, he, he mentioned, uh, for the sake of uniformity, he said that British Indian provinces had to be treated as sovereign states, as in Canada, where provinces retained sovereignty despite surrendering subjects to a federal center vested with residual powers. I think uh, the, the Americans sitting here would uh, understand that as well, uh, what federation is. Uh, we must start with that basis, he argued. So this was his case for Pakistan. He was extremely annoyed with the British for using the princely states to delay the transfer. Um, and so here I would like to just say that um, he didn't sort of have a lot of support um, from um, Muslim majority provinces, especially Punjab, a province that I come from. Um, and there, uh, their idea was very different. Uh, there the unionists were in power, as you all know. Um, uh, and they wanted strong provinces and a permanent British presence at the All India Centre. Mr. Jinnah was an anti-colonial nationalist and he wanted to be rid of the British. Um, but unfortunately, um, I mean, even the Aga Khan uh, talked of the United States of South Asia, in which the constituent units of the All India Federation would be sovereign entities that would delegate only limited power to the central government. Now, Mr. Jinnah had always wanted an effective central power. But because he realized that the Congress was wedded to the idea of a unitary center effectively, and he was effectively the, the Muslim majority provinces were against it, he went against his own better judgment 
to advocate the case of the Muslim provinces at the center with the Congress. I just like to mention here, because everybody knows about it, in his presidential address at the All India Muslim League session in Allahabad in December of 1930, uh, the great poet and philosopher Muhammad Iqbal, for whom I have enormous admiration, outlined the Punjabi Muslim solution of the religion, region, and nation problem. Democracy of the Western kind was unsuitable for India, where no community, Iqbal argued, was prepared to sink its individuality to form part of a larger whole. Muslims would stake all of their freedom for India if the principle of each group living according to its own culture and tradition was made the basis of that union. And so he proposed consolidating Muslim power, as you all know, in the northwestern regions uh, by amalgamating Punjab, the northwest frontier, Sindh, and Balochistan into a Muslim state. Um, uh, so this was his idea. And of course, you should also know that this idea was not entirely new. It, go, it has an earlier history. Um, uh, Theodore Mo Morrison, uh, principal of the Muslim Anglo-Oriental College, had noted the absence of any sense of nationality and even proposed that you may have to move Muslims from other parts of India uh, to the Northwest. Um, Lala Lajpat Rai, the great uh, Arya Samajist and Congress leader of the Punjab, went so far uh, as to not only echo these ideas, but proposed a partition of Punjab and Bengal um, if Muslims were going to be insistent in these two provinces that they must have their uh, uh, numerical uh, representation according to population. In the late 20s, the Aga Khan had spoken of an independent India as an association of free states before calling for a United States of Southern South Asia in the mid-1930s. Um, during the roundtable conferences of uh, 19, uh, the early 1930s, Shahdi Rahmat Ali um, uh, distributed uh, a leaflet uh, to the Muslim delegates advocating a Pakistan. I'd like to sort of take a minute to talk about this particularly because there's this belief that this was Jinnah's idea. Laughing at the scheme, Jinnah uttered, I must tell you that for myself, I only have Hindu friends. His relations with Rahmat Ali got off on the wrong track and remained in a state of disrepair even after the creation of Pakistan when Mr. Chaudhary Rahmat Ali said that the scheme of Pakistan was not his scheme. <laughs> now, so the point here is that student schemes had no place in the life of a seasoned politician. Uh, Iqbal's scheme was also a non-starter, even though it was located firmly within an all India context and not as a separate state. Um, so basically, Mr. Jinnah's relations with Punjabi politicians was not very good. Uh, and he had differences with Sindhi politicians as well. Um, so I mean, what I'm trying to get at is that it's interesting that Jinnah knew what he was trying to achieve through this federal idea. And at the second roundtable conference that Gandhi attended and sat on every single committee, Jinnah only sat on one committee. Guess what? Well, he sat on the Federal Structure Subcommittee, uh, uh, demanding that the British introduce full provincial autonomy and, at the same time, responsible government at the center and not use the princes to delay this matter. So he was very disappointed with this. Uh, but I am going to sort of uh, take this, uh, uh, you know, he was annoyed with, Pen uh, with the Punjab. But the Government of India Act, as you all know, of 1935, which provided the constitutional framework for independence and partition, um, was one of the reasons that Mr. Jinnah returned to India uh, in 1934, because he was opposed to it. And he was opposed to it uh, because he felt that it was not, not, not only not providing a responsible government at the center, but Muslims in the minority provinces were unhappy with its provisions. Muslims in the majority provinces could look forward to work provincial autonomy, but they were not happy. Uh, uh, but the Muslims in the minority provinces needed a strong center to offset their provincial disadvantages. So this was the reason why Jinnah returned. And he was president of the Muslim League uh, by March uh, 1934. Um, but the problem, of course, as, and I'm not going to go into that very much, is that Mr. Jinnah, by the time the Government of India Act of 35 was unfurled and he took the League, a moribund League, because the League was practically nowhere uh, during the 20s when the Khilafat agitation had led to Khilafat committees effectively displacing the Muslim League, which, unlike the Congress, never really transitioned from a debating society uh, of the select to a mass-based organization. Like 
under Gandhi during the 1920s, the Congress did. So this was a, a problem for him. And he kept talking about the need uh, for unity. But the 1937 elections, as you all know, um, were, I mean, even in this great province of Sindh, uh, regional parties were favored over the Muslim League. And the Muslim League, despite possessing separate electorates, managed a measly 4.4% of the total Muslim vote. So that gives you an idea of where Mr. Jinnah started. Um, the outbreak of war in Europe changed matters. Um, uh, with Congress refusing to cooperate with the British, the Muslim League became important. And Jinnah took the opportunity to make the most of it. And it was in that context that the Muslim League's Lahore Resolution of 1940 has to be seen. I might just remind some of you uh, who have not read the resolution in, for a while. The resolution makes no mention of Pakistan, partition, or even a center, uh, whether weak or strong, which is rather an odd omission, given the fact that Mr. Jinnah was always concerned about power at the center. The crux of the League's demand was that all future constitutional negotiations from now had to be based on the idea that Indian Muslims were not a minority, which is what separate electorates uh, or, uh, 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 signified, but a nation on an equal footing with the Hindu nation. Uh, that was his point, because in the family of nations, big and small are equal, and you get around the numerical problem. Um, during the course of the war, uh, he did very well uh, in, uh, I mean, the idea of Pakistan came to appeal to large segments of Muslims, uh, even though uh, he, the League deliberately did not define the geographical boundaries. Um, what Jinnah was really aiming for after 1940 was something, a constitutional arrangement that would give Muslims something close to parity at a center that would be reestablished on the basis either of um, a partnership between two essentially sovereign states, Pakistan representing the Muslim majority provinces and Hindustan. And please note that Jinnah, as late as, I mean, until 46, 47, always spoke of Pakistan and Hindustan, not Pakistan and India. He, in fact, contested until the bitter end Congress's right to call itself India, because as far as he was concerned, Pakistan had to be part of India for it to be called India. The rest was Hindustan, Pakistan and Hindustan. Um, and it was because of this recognition that when the British finally decided that the time had come for them to get out, and I don't have the time to develop the reasons for that, the cabinet mission plan for a three-tiered federal arrangement, which I need to show you. I lost all my slides, but this is the cabinet mission plan. Um, for a three-tier federal, uh, three federal uh, arrangement for India and with compulsory grouping for provinces at the second tier. So provinces A were the Hindu majority provinces, provinces B were the northwest frontier provinces, uh, northwest, northwestern provinces, Punjab, NWFP, Sindh, and Baluchistan. And provinces C was Bengal and Assam, and the provinces below. So Mr. Jinnah needed this because he wanted to control the provinces before going into the federal center where the Congress's brute majority would make it impossible for him uh, to achieve his ends in the making of the Constitution. Um, the point I'm going to make is that, you know, uh, Mr. Jinnah accepted the federal arrangement uh, as opposed to the Pakistan, the sovereign Pakistan that was on offer which was based on divided Punjab and Bengal, or effectively Punjab minus its Muslim, uh, non-Muslim uh, majority districts of Eastern Punjab and Bengal minus its non-Muslim uh, majority districts of West Bengal, including Calcutta. Mr. Jinnah had always demanded undivided Punjab and Bengal and insisted until the end that the, the principle of the partition of the provinces should not be confused with the principle of Pakistan. That was his point. Because he needed these two provinces to negotiate with the Congress. Because undivided Punjab and Bengal, and this is something that everybody forgets, if there had been no partition, if you can just dream of that virtual uh, suggestion, um, which two provinces would have dominated India? Punjab and Bengal, not UP and Bihar. So dividing those two provinces uh, made sense for people who could see benefits. Uh, but Mr. Jinnah wanted undivided Punjab and Bengal for Pakistan. Um, 
So um, I might also point out to you that um, it was the Congress that embraced the Hindu Mahasabha's call to partition Punjab and Bengal in March 1947. Uh, they, th it, was, it was the call of the Mahasabha that Nehru accepted, and on March 8th, the Congress endorsed partition. Um, Jinnah uh, continued objecting uh, to this, uh, but what I also want to point out that the Pakistan he eventually got uh, in 19. 47 was a Pakistan that he had rejected twice. Once uh, in 1944, when C.R. Raja Gopalachari, uh, the veteran Congress leader from Madras, offered him a Pakistan based on a partition of Punjab and Bengal, um, uh, to which, which he dismissed, uh, calling it um, a moth-eaten, mutilated Pakistan. And the second time was, of course, at the time I've just mentioned, of the Cabinet Mission Plan of 1946. That is merely one year before Pakistan came into existence. He accepted this and went back on it because the Congress would not accept grouping. Uh, Gandhi said grouping is worse than partition. Jinnah said grouping is the guts of the matter. And of course, we all know that Nehru came out and said on July 11th uh, that who, is the, who are the British to tell us that the center will be restricted to defense, foreign affairs, and communications. That was the idea, the three-tiered federal arrangement, the, the federal center would only have uh, powers for defense, foreign affairs, and communications. All other powers would rest in the provinces. That was the game. Uh, now, I just want to say, finally, uh, to, as I conclude this, um, as the fragile crust of order, as the British insisted on getting out of India quickly, um, Jinnah's na options narrowed, uh, ultimately forcing him to acquiesce to a Pakistan uh, that was really a shadow of what he had devoted his life to achieve on behalf of India's Muslims. In the brutal metaphor of Britain's last viceroy, quote, administratively, it was the difference between putting up a permanent building, a nice hut, or a tent. As far as Pakistan is concerned, we are putting up a tent. We can do no more. Mountbatten fully expected the fragile tent to collapse, because tents, as you all know, are folded up <laughs> pretty quickly. If not for a, a series of astute moves by Jinnah as the governor general, I mean, I know that there, is a, 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 there are quarters in Pakistan that question Jinnah's decision to become governor general. And I wrote an article soon after I finished my thesis um, that if he hadn't really taken on as the governor general of the new state, Pakistan may not have succeeded in belying the last viceroy's wicked prophecy. The price paid for survival, however, has been unacceptably high. Extended periods of political denial, economic exclusion under military dictatorship have generated resentments in entire provinces wreaking havoc on Pakistan's fragile federal configuration. The aim of the radical fringe in non-Punjabi provinces, including Sindh, is no longer the 1973 constitution, on which, again, I don't have much time to speak, but the Muslim League's 1940 resolution with its confederal overtones, promising maximum autonomy and sovereignty to the constituent units of the proposed Muslim state. The willingness of Pakistanis to contemplate a notional reconstitution of the federal center to arrive at a more accommodative, fair, and just union uh, will in large part determine whether Jinnah's case for a Pakistan can withstand the paralyzing challenges of the present and the trials and tribulations of an uncertain future. Jinnah's case for Pakistan rested not on religious exclusivism, but sound constitutional principles of federal rights. His motto of unity, discipline, and faith, and message of hope, courage, and confidence, to say nothing of what I think is his most memorable statement, failure is a word unknown to me, ought to be inspiration enough for Pakistanis to grasp the nettle and save their country from chaos and disintegration. We have a state, Jinnah said, in which we can live and breathe as free men, and I would add women too, um, and which we can develop according to our own lights and culture, and where principles of Islamic social justice can find free play. In stating his conception of Pakistan, the qaeda -e azam acknowledged the continued salience of some sort of a state of temporal and spiritual union 
presiding over regions with shares of sovereignty and citizens with multiple identities, an idea of freedom where Pakistanis in all their diversities um, and differences could live um, the lives they valued with dignity, responsibility, and a sense of security. It is tragic that the nation state that is the embodiment of Muslim aspirations and distinctive culture in the subcontinent has not only failed to realize the expectations of its main architect, but made a travesty of the federal principles on the basis of which he advocated and ultimately won the case for Pakistan. The four decades since the end of World War II were the heyday of indivisible, non-negotiable sovereignty across the globe. Since the late 1980s, there has been a perceptible weakening in the hold of that dogma. Not to, I mean, you know, the very fact that the European Union, for all its problems, talked about shared sovereignty is what I'm alluding to. Jinnah's legacy is especially pertinent uh, to the enterprise of rethinking sovereignty not, in not just Pakistan, but also South Asia and beyond in the 21st century. If Pakistan and also India can shed the dead weight, dead weight of the colonial inheritance of an idea of non-negotiable sovereignty, which goes against the face of their own history of shared and uh, uh, layered sovereignties, um, uh, I mean, and, and so I, I mean, I think that there would be hope for uh, a very different kind of accommodation of the animosities that have made things so difficult for this region. Um, and so I think that if they were to do that, a broad South Asia union uh, with India and Pakistan as sovereign states may yet come into being under the capacious cover of Jinnah's metaphorical umbrella. Mechanical adherence to a fading idea like monolithic sovereignty, which was a colonial idea, has stunted the subcontinent's imagination ever since the fateful summer of 1947. With the Kashmir conflict hanging fire and a war with no foreseeable end raging menacingly in the northwestern parts of the subcontinent, Pakistanis and also Indians desperately need to rustle up the courage and the conviction to use Jinnah's umbrella to the mutual benefit of their poverty-stricken, woefully governed, corrupt and violence-ridden, nuclearized countries. Thank you very much.